They don't have any convictions. They don't have anything at their core that pulls their life together. You and I do. And that core is Jesus Christ and His truth. And so before we can have courage, we've got to have conviction. We've got to know and be dedicated. There's the idea of commitment. We've got to be dedicated to what that truth is. What that core of our being is. And we've got that core, we've got that conviction that we're committed to it, then we're prepared to be courageous. One man wrote about the Apostle Paul that people tried to beat him to get him to stop preaching. And he preached anyway. And they threw him in jail to try to keep, to keep, keep him from preaching. And so he wrote letters. And they finally killed him. But then he went to be with Jesus in heaven. You know, if you and I have that kind of core conviction and commitment to that, that conviction, then we can have courage. Then we can stand up and we can live a life for God and we can say no to sin and temptation because we know that God's way is going to be better. And so that's the first thing that I find in J.R. Baxter's song, to live close to God each day. The second one is the idea that a daily walk involves work. Notice he says, not the crown nor renown that the world might see. In other words, I'm not after being recognized by the world. I don't care about certificates. I don't care about trophies. I don't care about wealth. I don't care about having my name in the newspaper. I don't care about being seen on TV. I don't care about being popular. But, he says, I will work and never shirk for his blessed Lord. Isn't that where the glory really is? Serving God in ways that the world doesn't see? Let's look again at the story of Tabitha, who's also known as Dorcas, in Acts chapter 9. Turn over to Acts chapter 9. And look at this example of this wonderful widow woman, elderly woman, and see how Luke the historian describes her the Christian nature. Acts chapter 9. If you're using the Bible in the pews, page 918. Mm -hmm. One of the last stories that we have related to the Apostle Peter. <coughs> Beginning in verse 36. Luke the historian writes, Now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding, notice, with deeds of kindness, and charity, which she continually did. She was always involved in the work of the Lord. How are you going to be faithful on Monday? You see that what you're doing is the work of the Lord. Now that may not be preparing a bottle of flats, but if it's serving your fellow man in the job that you have, then you're doing the work of the Lord. God has designed all of us individually. And He's given every one of us a unique, a unique set of skills and abilities and likes and dislikes. And then, and we'll talk about this at our church retreat, God put us in His body where He wants us to be. And He gives us those skills that He wants us to use for Him. And that's what Dorcas is doing here. She has the skill to be able to make things with her hands. Look at verse 37. It happened at that time that she fell sick and died, and when they had washed her body, they laid it in the upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. And so Peter arose and he went with them. And when he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Dorcas was busy doing the Lord's work, not necessarily in evangelism, but she was serving where God had placed her. These widows were standing around and saying, wow, look at this quilt that Dorcas had sewn while she was here. There was a family right down the road here who lost their house in a, in a fire and they needed everything. And the one thing that she could do was make quilts. And so she made a quilt to keep it warm during the winter time. 
working. Ooh. Serving God where we are. Verse 40, Peter sent out all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and raised her up, calling the saints and widows who presented her a lot. We need to be busy doing the work of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, let me read that verse to you and notice, listen to how comprehensive Paul is in this verse as he describes how God prepares us for what he wants us to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Paul says, God is able. Uh, you and I look at ourselves and we say, well, I can't accomplish a lot. I can't do a lot. And that's true. God didn't create us to be supermen and superwomen. But notice that God can work through us to accomplish super things in the life of someone else. God is able to make all grace abound to you. Notice all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything you may have in abundance for every good deed. Did you catch the comprehensive nature of that verse? God has something in, in plan for you to do in somebody else's life, in the life of your family, or somebody else, and they were maybe even a stranger. But God is going to provide everything you need to accomplish that work. And so we need to think and look at our daily lives as being the Word of God that He has called us to do. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, again, that work may be evangelism, but it may not be. It may be simply performing a work for my boss that he's asked me to do. Being a good employee. For Moses, the work of Christ was leading the Israelites across the Red Sea. For Samson, the work of Christ was killing the Philistines. For other people, the work of Christ was something different. Nehemiah, the work of Christ was built, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. You see, those are not inherently evangelistic things. They were simply doing the work that God had called them to do at that time. And so if you are a grandparent, then your work is being a grandparent. Your work is doing what you can to teach your grandson or your granddaughter the gospel of Christ. To share with them what Christ means to you, how Christ has helped you over the years. Your work is to be a great man. If you are a mama or a dad, your work for Christ is to be a mama or a dad. To bring your children to worship, to bring them to Bible class, to teach them at home, to know who God is, to know who Jesus is, and to try to apply the teachings of Jesus to their lives as you try to apply it to your life. Your work is to be a your work might be to be a, a good aunt or a good uncle. My sister and her husband don't have any children. But they try to be a good aunt and a good uncle to Jewel and Anna, and they try to help them to be Christians in the way that they can be. So our work varies and depends on who we are and where we are in life. And so when you wake up tomorrow morning, you wake up Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, you go to work, I want you to remind yourself, I am doing the work of Christ and what I'm doing. The third that we have is that daily work involves helping. He says, help me bear and share some poor pilgrim's love as Christ is his freedom. Now, let's go back and look at the story that Brother Alan read for us earlier, and that's in 2 Kings chapter 4. Look back over 2 Kings chapter 4 and notice what, how God used Elisha the prophet to help others. And this, again, is not uh, a series of events that have to do with evangelism. It's a series of events that have to do with helping people. 
Helping other people bear their burden, sharing the responsibility of carrying their load. Now, when you look at Elijah, and we know more about Elijah, it seems like, and Elisha, Jesus' ministry really more aptly reflects the nature of Elisha's preaching than it does Elijah. Elijah really doesn't perform a lot of miracles in his work. Elisha does. And you may have noticed that on the one that Alan read as parallel Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fish. Let's begin at verse 38. 17 chapter 4, verse 38. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land, and as the son of the prophets, that is, these prophets who were learning how to be prophets, were sitting before him, he said to his servant, Put on a large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. And then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild boars and came and sliced them in the pot of stew. Doesn't that sound good? Next fellowship, you know, let's have a, a stew of boars. Vines. Sounds good, doesn't it? Slice them into the pot of stew. They did not know what they were. So they poured it out for the men to eat. And as they were eating up of the stew, they cried out and said, Oh man of God, there's death in the pot. And they were not able to eat it. Well, what's Elisha going to do? You can't run down to the store and buy something else. He said, Now bring meal. And they poured it into the pot. And he said, Pour it out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Elijah, Elisha rather, comes along and he helps those who need help. And then again in the next section there, verses 42 through 44, is where Elisha has the man feed a hundred people or so with 20 loaves of bread. Now that does not compare to Jesus feeding five thousand with five loaves of bread and two fish, but it's the same type of thing. He was concerned about helping the poor. Now, we as a congregation do a lot in serving the poor, of course, through our food pantry on Thursday mornings. But you and I, as individual Christians, need to look for, pray for opportunities Monday through Saturday and walk away and not serve the poor. Not something big. Something that's helpful. So that's something helpful. It might be something big or it might be something little. But it's something that is helpful to someone else. Galatians 6 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, Let us do good to all men, especially to those from the household of the faith. And in 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, rather 5, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, Seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Seek after what is good. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 18, instruct the Christians, he says, to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and to share. And so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning, that needs to be our mentality. How can I help somebody else? How can I help? Someone else. How can I do good for someone else? And then Hebrews 13 and verse 16, the Hebrew writer says, Do not neglect doing good and sharing. Notice, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And so when the God of heaven looks down at us on earth and he sees us doing these little things for other people, God accepts that as a sacrifice to him. And we need to remember that. Well, the fourth thing, that fourth and final thing that J.R. Baxter brings out is, of course, worship. A daily walk involves worship. Notice he says in verse 1, I want to spend my days in my prayers. All the journey through. Let me live close to thee each day. Do we have a song in our heart? during the week. I find it personally to be very helpful to have CDs in the car of gospel singing. I don't